Hey guys, I'm Tim Kotzman here with Brom Canstein. And uh, what brings you to New York from the Netherlands? Oh man, well, I actually went uh, to Miami before I went here okay. to a uh, guest on uh, Breedlove's uh, show, which uh, was really fun. He's been a big inspiration for me in, in, in my Bitcoin journey uh, and also my podcast uh, journey. So it was really great to meet him, thank him also for, for the inspiration. I think uh, it's always very important. Like now that I, I started a year ago, my own podcast and well, uh, I'm, I'm meeting with someone here in New York that listened to all, all of the episodes, which uh, is still a bit mind blowing to me, actually, that, uh, you know, your content can reach that far. I see that with you as well, like you starting this and reaching another type of audience about uh, about Bitcoin, you know, I think it's very uh, rewarding. Um, but actually, yeah, I'm just in New York to meet fellow some fellow Bitcoiners. Yesterday, I went to PubKey and uh, yeah, just hanging around basically. And uh, and now I'm here. I uh, I, uh, I reached out to you, and uh, I think uh, it's great what you're starting. So uh, I think fun chat today to uh, thank you. Yeah, explore appreciate, Bitcoin. Yeah, appreciate you making the time. Yeah, and, of course. Um, yeah, it's a small world. Um, you know, we won't go into specifics, but you know maybe somebody that you just had lunch with. I also shared a taxi with from JFK <laughs> back into the city just yeah. a few days ago. Yeah, so it's yeah, such yeah, a yeah. small world. Yeah. Very funny. Yeah. And very cool. Um, yeah. I, part of my journey, I, you know, was watching as many Michael Saylor videos as were on YouTube. But at a certain point, like, I want to look in people's eyes and like, just mm. see that it's an actual person. Yeah. And so like, I just, I flew to El Salvador by myself, went to oh, an wow. event that Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert were hosting nice. and Robert Breedlove was there yeah. and, you know, they did their talk. And then afterwards I just looked behind me and Robert's sitting there with like literally a dozen eggs on a plate. <laughs> and I was like, that's what billionaires eat these days. Cause when egg prices were like a billion dollars for three eggs, and it was like <laughs> yeah. very, I don't know. I thought it was funny. But no, super awesome people. And um, yeah, I, do you want to talk a little bit about um, your journey? I know we were talking just a minute ago about um, some bored apes or, or something else. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, but but we, we don't need to spend too much time on it. But well, no, it's I, kind of funny and it's part of the journey. I like I like the sentence, you know, you got a shit coin before you before you Bitcoin. I think uh, <laughs> I like that people people get into Bitcoin from different touch points and kind of dimensions, right? Like uh, if you're from finance or, or have an economics background or you're a techie or, or whatever, like there's there's all these different ways that you you can get into Bitcoin. Like I personally, uh, I discovered it in like 2014. I saw a video that explained Bitcoin very factually, like how it technically um, worked. And I I approached it first just in that way, like, uh, like Jack Dorsey has said a lot, like, you know, the internet needs a currency. And when I saw that video, I was like, okay, this sounds like the currency for the internet. Let's make it made a lot of sense. Actually, in the beginning, when I started looking into, okay, then what is blockchain and, and all these things, uh, I actually found Litecoin. And then I thought, oh, Litecoin is, uh, is, is the better thing. I actually had a presentation at a, uh, the biggest bank in my country about Litecoin when, and when at the same time, there was another guy that had a presentation about Bitcoin before me. And I had all these arguments why, uh, why Litecoin uh, was better, you know, but I, f I think you have to really dive into it to not really have an opinion, but to actually understand it, you know, like I like the meme of, you know, Bitcoin is everything you don't understand about money and everything you don't understand about computers and economy and finance and all, all these things, sociology and, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Physics, math, you know. Um, before you can really understand the profoundness of Bitcoin, you have to shitcoin, I think, you know, there's some people that got it immediately or like had, had the right, I think, primers to to get it and really see like its place in in the world. I think it took me a bit longer, although I've looked up old tweets from like 2013, where I say like Bit Bitcoin is a synthesized digital commodity, something, something, and I'm like, damn, I got it, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get it. Yeah. You know, and it took me some time to see that, you know, it's not only blockchain, it's not only the speed, it's not only, you know, what, whatever characteristics you would uh, uh, look at, but I think the eventual discovery of finite absolute or like absolute digital scarcity is is the essence of what you need to understand and from there i think you can take different paths to you know how is that enforced why does it matter what is it 
what does it solve what is the actual problem you know what is value what is money what is property what is you know, all, all these things and uh, yeah just you know off cam i said i think in the ico age i funded uh, i don't know 20 neo banks that don't exist you know i did uh, all the <laughs> nft stuff uh, I woke up at like 3, 4 a.m. in the morning to buy board Ape Land, and then I had to pay 10K in gas and borrow that from someone and then split my profit when I sold like my land to a very famous rapper from the UK, actually, like in, a, in like an OTC one-on-one -on -one deal. It was really funny. <laughs> but uh, I think it's a good analogy because eventually um, <laughs> I talk with a lot of people about Bitcoin, you know, like uh, people that are have, have money and they need to protect wealth and they are into... I met a guy a few weeks ago who has like, I don't know, 80 million or something and he's in full on into real estate. And I just asked him, is it fun? And he's like, no, it's not necessarily fun. And then I asked him, but why are you doing real estate, you know, as a, having real estate as an asset or, um, you know, your activity to protect or, or grow your wealth? And he's like, yeah, he was silent for a few minutes. And then he answered, he's like, yeah, I actually don't really know. And I think that's an interesting angle eventually to get people onto Bitcoin is is showing them that what they think of money or property or the activities that you are pursuing to to protect or grow your wealth. Um, yeah, if you cannot substantiate why you're doing it, it's going to be really hard to, to, to keep doing it. And when I told him like Bitcoin literally makes me sleep better at night, I'm not waking up at 4 a.m. anymore to trade, you know, NFT uh, monkey lands. Um, yeah, it did, like in that way, it improves my life in a sense. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it was a great conversation. We talked for like two hours and eventually he asked me like, okay, I'm going to be in a plane for 10 hours. What would you recommend me to watch? And then I just sent him, you know, Lynn Alden, Broken Money, Jack Mahler's uh, Bitcoin explanation in, uh, in Madeira, Sailor video, another Mahler's video and a Sailor video. And I just said like, watch all of this. This is from 10 years, you know, I think... 10 years in Bitcoin, these are the five videos you should watch and just write all your thoughts down, all your questions. And then when you're back and you want to, then I'm always down to sit and and go further in your thought process around, you know, what what is this thing? So I think like next week or the week after we're, we're going to sit down and he, he, he did his study and wrote down like all of his questions. And uh, I think, yeah, once you get to the understanding that this absolute digital scarcity is such a profound discovery, which, you know, Fidelity uh, has a report where it's like akin to fire or the wheel. You can only invent something like that once. Yeah, once you get there, it's you, you cannot unsee it anymore. And anything else that you compare it to is, uh, yeah, basically a headache or, you know, you can make more of it. And that's kind of my thesis, I think, for, for Bitcoin in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's no bigger addressable market than global capital yeah i mean that I, don't, I haven't heard any argument against that one um what's the culture and the media like in the netherlands when it comes to bitcoin like do you feel like it's a higher adoption rate lower hard to tell mm -hmm. and then like on the media front is everyone over there watching the same Michael Saylor videos? Are they like no. watching the same Natalie Brunel, Dylan LeClaire interviews? Or are there media personalities over there that are filling some of those roles? Or like, I'm yeah, there's so like, curious. there's like two, two, three people. Someone recently said, you know, if there's three experts in our country, then I would be one of them. I don't know if that's true, but that's, I, if that would be true, I think uh, the, <laughs> the scale is very very small <laughs> um but there are some there, there are some people there's actually um uh, ex uh, central bank director who's very not not necessarily very vocal uh, vocal about bitcoin but he talks a lot about you know all deficit spending all the debt all the the flaws in the in the construction of the euro for example that um and i think there was a nice insight i actually got a few weeks ago that for example the the U.S. started as uh, uh, a political unity and then came the money afterwards, basically. And in Europe, it's the other way around. They came up with a monetary unification and now they're trying to put like some political system on, on top of it. And so there's big discussion. Uh, for example, my country is, is, is one of the, the founders of the EU. They're one of the richest countries. They don't, you know, we profit from it, but we don't really want to give away control to newer countries that 
need our help, for example. And these newer countries, of course, would love the love the help because that would make them prosper more. So there, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, should there be a political, a, a real political uh, union? And, and for example, this guy, this ex-central bank director is really opposed to it because he says like uh, this, this entire concept of this monetary union is is flawed uh, anyway. So there are people that that talk about it, and usually my country is very um, uh, forward thinking with in terms of like technological adoption. So like uh, cell phones and internet. Like uh, I think internet adoption is above ninety nine point eight percent or something in my in my country. Um, also, already since like early nineties, I think. But uh, you know the money just works. So when you're a kid and you get some coins and you go to a store and you get a lollipop or a soda or a bread, yeah, apparently this is what we do to trade with each other. And there's so much prosperity, especially from, you know, golden age and all the trade across the world that, yeah, we still live off that. Uh, and gold in the central bank is a really big thing. So it's 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 not really we 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 are probably the last country to have uh, a serious <laughs> problem in in the, one of the last countries I think in the European Union. So the debate is not that alive, I would say. But yeah, I mean, people do feel the inflation, uh, and and it's the same gaslighting as here. I'd say you know, like when they say like, oh, you know, this month inflation went down. So it's now near 2%, uh, but there's still inflation, you know, like it's not that they're saying, well, it has been four plus percent for, you know, two years or, so, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Home prices are crazy. I actually calculated from 2014 to 2024, average home in the Netherlands selling price went from 224K euro to 460K euro. Wow. Uh, and in Bitcoin, it went from like, I want to say 1800 Bitcoin to six. So, oh, seven maybe now. Um, Where in your journey did you start thinking in Bitcoin? And do you actually, not that long ago, book, because I. Or do you think in Bitcoin and a currency or just Bitcoin uh, primarily? No, I, I try to. Yeah, no, I do, I do think still in currency, but I think there are some interesting ways that you can show that that the money is debased, right? Mm -hmm. And that the, for example, the homes, like a functionality of a home has not changed since the invention of homes, right? The, the utility value or the utility or like the energy that's needed to grow an apple or something, or, you know, that has not changed, but mm -hmm. the the money that we use to price it, of course, lost its value. So you need more units to, to, to pay for the same thing. And I got to this, housing equation basically you know to show that everything gets cheaper when you um denominate it in bitcoin after i saw a guy on twitter go on tradingview.com you know where you can see the charts charts and he said okay um nasdaq smp you know he, he took some a big uh, uh you know you can see homes i think also there's like a home index you know put it in dollars and it's probably somewhere up, right? It's not all-time high, but it's up compared to 10 years ago. But if you denominate all those indexes in M2 money supply, they're very low. And the one that really blew my mind was for the NASDAQ, right? So tech stocks, mm -hmm. you, it's almost all-time high in dollar terms, but if you denominate it in M2 money supply, so that would represent the real value, the value of the NASDAQ currently is lower than at the peak of the dot-com bubble which hmm. is wrong because right. we have yeah. better tech than 24 years ago. Yeah. But for me, that was a really great um, illustration of, you know, the way, the way that we're going, you have like Lynn Alden and Jeff Booth talk about, you know, like over time, I think a lot of people would agree by the way, like true technology, we become more efficient, prices should go down, right? Like if, if everything eventually becomes democratized through tech, like for example, you know, when you look at your iPhone or like the, when I was in high school, I had to buy like a two hundred dollar calculator to do my um, my physics and and all these things. Like that that functionality is now in my iPhone for free, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, that's eventually where we where we go. But the inflationary force of of the of the money that's that speed is way way quicker than than what the speed could be uh, going down in prices and accessibility of of technology, etc. And I always use, uh, kind of use like the bread example, 
I don't understand why it's funny that we say, you know, like in the 60s, the bread was 20 cents and now it's four dollars. I think that's the prime example of these two forces that are battling each other um, because the bread currently is probably worse and has more ingredients and nutritionally is worse than the bread of, yeah. you know, 50, 60 years ago. But you cannot argue against the fact that we probably became more efficient in creating bread. I don't, I don't, that sounds very logical and rational to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I would argue that that is true. But yeah, if you need more dollar units to pay for the same thing, then, you know, I think that clearly shows um, which side is winning, basically. So in my country, a lot of people experience this, of course, like uh, groceries and all these things. Homes are, are way more expensive. But uh, I, I think we still have a way to a good life to actually realize that, yeah, we have a serious problem and it's interesting coming from Europe to here I tweeted about that the people laughed about it like I, I was in Miami and I had like a chicken burger and uh, like a virgin mojito and I had to pay like 42 dollars and I was like no like European mind cannot comprehend that basically <laughs> <laughs> you know it's I, I don't think there's any place in my country where I would pay that amount of money for the same thing what would the equivalent be like half that price maybe probably something like that yeah. yeah so i said you know the tweet was funny i said like you know if you need 42 dollar units to buy this then damn your money is uh very broken you know maybe your money's a shit coin maybe yeah <laughs> where do you see bitcoin going as far as people use the word bitcoinization like mm -hmm. are most of the fiat currency is going to fail, but the US dollar will still be standing for some amount of time? Or are they all going to zero against yeah. Bitcoin, as Max would say? I mean, I, I for, previously, I really saw it as like, we are replacing this fiat system and everything needs to break. And I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think this is a really big fight. Uh, I think that's a different conversation. But eventually, I think it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual fight in a sense. But um, I now see Bitcoin and I, I needed someone else to show me this. So I'm grateful for them, but I kind of see it as a mirror. So I see it as like this other system that just exists that we know cannot be corrupted. We know is a mutually beneficial game versus, you know, the fiat, fiat money system is a zero sum game. And that because it exists and doesn't go away, it acts as a mirror for this flawed system, the flawed fiat system. And I think once that concept permeates more with us talking about it, people actually, you know, realizing that $42 for a chicken burger and a virgin mojito is uh, quite, quite a lot of, uh, of dollar units, right, that you, that you need. I think slowly people will see that the, that the people that adopted this other thing are happier and have more time and space to think about their life or, you know, be more entrepreneurial or whatever. I do think that will take some time um, but yeah, I kind of see it like that. It's going to be like a parallel, parallel system. And so I also don't see it as like investing in Bitcoin or you're, you're just selling the economic energy you have in one system and or like you're, you're transferring it to the other. Like I see the price as a exchange rate basically. Mm -hmm. So I'm in this one money system, but there's this other thing that, you know, you can verify for yourself and it, it exists. It will keep existing. Yeah, you can just move. So you can move all the monetary energy that you gathered up until now with the value that you traded in the in the world. And yeah, you can just move to this to this other money. And why I think that is a is a good way to look at it is I mean, like this week we saw the the ECB paper. I think there was another uh, I don't know which which Federal Reserve, like a local one here, uh, also had a paper about Bitcoin. Like they're paying attention. It's crazy that they're already paying attention. And I had the same thought about, uh, you know, the ETF adoption. Like, do you know how many ideas are released on the internet every day? How wild is it that, that, that Wall Street adopts a random idea from a random internet forum that, you know, got released 15 years ago? That it's, it's just really significant. And central banks paying attention to this thing where it's just like 1.3, you know, trillion, something like that, I think should be a huge signal because they know, they even wrote it down, right? Not owning Bitcoin makes you poor. So yeah, I think I think that's that's fascinating. So they know, I don't think they fully understand it, but they know it's a great threat, maybe more because they understand that their system is flawed and predatory. 
So uh, I, yeah, I really think this is going to be a fight. I think we will get blamed for the 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 degrading trust in the fiat money eventually. So we'll see uh, we'll see who's right in the end. But I, I think that's where, where we're going to go, and I think it's fascinating that they're paying attention. And the next, you know, year, nine years until twenty thirty three, I think, are going to be the most interesting because in twenty thirty three, ninety nine percent of all Bitcoin will be mined. And the last percent is just a rounding error, right? Over the next uh, 107 years. And people are going to figure it out. Countries are going to figure it out. They they have to. So, um, yeah, I think I always use the word entertaining. Like, mm -hmm. I think I see it. I think what this can be. Yeah. And I'm just watching it unfold, basically. Yeah. How do you um, kind of think about Twitter and how... Do you use it as far as like there's so much noise mm -hmm. <laughs> and to like actually <clears throat> like if someone's listening to a youtube video and but they don't even have a twitter account i know part of my journey was i had a guy come alongside me and say oh you got to get on twitter i'm like oh i have an account i set it up years ago but yeah. like I, I don't even know what my login is mm -hmm. oh you got to follow these accounts you got to follow michael saylor you got to follow you know robert Breedlove and and like start digging into this stuff yeah um but like so many things in life, it's easy to get distracted and, you know, start listening to some Twitter space where people are talking about something that just might not be that important right then or at all. <laughs> I mm -hmm. mean, it, how do you navigate that? Or like if you have people ask you, like, what are the best resources or ways to go about things? You don't get tripped up with, you know, some craziness. Very good question. I, I think I was lucky in a sense that like I have a, I have a background in tech and startups and I, I've been on Twitter for, I don't know, 15 years or something like from, from pretty early on. And so I've really had a lot of time to kind of like um, curate the, the the follow, the the people that I follow. I think I follow like 4,000 4, accounts or something. So I think I was kind of lucky that I got into this pretty early and, and also being like a millennial, I think in general, you have a... Uh, a good understanding of yeah you know, how do you f check information on the internet right how like how do you judge things you you read basically because you grew up with the internet so i think i did have some advantage on on x but um or yeah what it's called what it's called now i just say twitter because <clears throat> yeah I, actually too me too i don't know why i said x actually yeah so twitter but um it is technically correct I, I actually before there was this premium accounts and 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 you know people are paying now i always said like i would pay 50 dollars a month for twitter because i got you know, through my entire career, all these connections. I mean, we know each other from Twitter and I, I've met so many people that I've met from Twitter. I, sometimes I say to my girlfriend, she's like, who are you meeting? Yeah, sometimes someone I met from Twitter. Like this, uh, it, it's been yeah. tr super beneficial in my entire uh, career, basically, you know, getting information, connecting with people. Um, I do agree. It's probably pretty hard to kind of like get into it now and build like, of eventually it is some sort of information bubble right um i don't know if i have an honest like clear answer to that i think i think as with all tech i always think you should just yeah pr practice it like you have to get comfortable with how something works how do i dissect this information i don't know i think that's very basic advice i don't, I don't know if i have a clear answer uh, to that what i do think is that you know because there's so many ideas that are launched on the internet every day, I, I, I've always seen Twitter as like the town square where people talk about these things. You know, I think it's totally different than Reddit or Facebook or any of the, uh, these other websites. And you see how fast the information goes, basically. Uh, I mean, you just started also publishing this, you know, like you see how many people you can reach if you yeah, know what you're talking about or who you want to reach, you can talk in a certain way and yeah, I think that's the magic of the internet. Like you don't really know where whatever you create lands and with who and why it resonates with them, for example. And I think Twitter is perfect, um, perfect for that. I think it's also a very good tool to, yeah, basically check your own research or your own thoughts, like find other people that talk about a certain subject in a similar way. You can easily connect with them. So yeah, I think it's perfect, uh, a perfect tool. I see it as a tool. I don't know if this is an answer, but that's kind of it. Okay, absolutely cool. Is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. 
sometimes when I'm a few weeks ago, a certain event happened and I opened up Twitter and an account that is an individual account, they had posted what had happened. Mm. And the next day I thought, how did I find out about this event that just happened in the world mm. from an individual account and not from a news source? I mean, it's just the world is definitely changing. Well, in that sense, it's decentralization as well. Uh, I think Bitcoin will actually profit a lot from that. Like you see that information is being decentralized, computing power is being decentralized, you know, with AI, not, um, how to say, like the workforce is being decentralized, the money is being decentralized. And it's very interesting to see like all these kind of like parallel developments. They, they are moving in convergence in, in some way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I saw an episode that was Breedlove with, um, what's his name, Ian, something like Cancel, you know, Cancel Clothing Co. Like that guy that, that talks about like CIA, so whatever. he dissects all this stuff. He has like 2 million TikTok followers or something. And he's very diligent. Like he shows how diligent he is. Like it's not just like, oh, look at what, what now happened or just throwing stuff out there. Like he's really showing this is how I work. And I think what's interesting there is that usually you're just confronted with the result of some sort of research, you know, and then a label is put on it like, oh, this comes from this institute or that, you know, whatever, um, spokesperson or government person or whatever. But now you can really, it's the same as with SoundCloud or YouTube, like people who are good or, or Instagram, people who are good at photos or good at music, right? Like mm -hmm. if you are good at research, you can now find people that uh, respect your research, right? And uh, follow your way of researching and you can be totally transparent about it. And I think like that authenticity is something that um, is a big part of, of this entire decentralization movement. Like you have to, because there's so much noise, like you have to be clear with your way of working or your intentions or whatever, kind of like make it verifiable. You know, that's, uh, I think, you know, in the case of Bitcoin, uh, the ultimate, characteristic like anyone listening to us doesn't have to believe that bitcoin is a thing they can verify it for themselves right and i think we invite people to verify it for themselves yeah so i think in in general decentralization kind of like pushes people towards that also like you can now basically do your own research how tinfoil hat that may sound <laughs> I think, yeah absolutely it's i think it's great that now you might need to have some personality characteristics to be okay um, being a public figure, being on camera or putting your writing out, putting whatever your product or yourself is out into the public domain, but mm. you can be a specialist and um, be valued for it, whether it's recognition or uh, financial or both. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> the analogy in my head is almost like if you really want social media to be decentralized, maybe you're an early adopter to Noster mm -hmm. or Noster, yeah. however you want to pronounce it. I think um, I say Noster, yeah. And if it's like, that's too much for you, then maybe you're on Twitter mm -hmm. um, in the same way that like, maybe you have Bitcoin in self-custody uh, or maybe you have it on an exchange or in an ETF. I mean, there's just different levels of yeah. comfort. Yeah. And, um, and understanding also, I think, right? So. Yeah. Why is self custody important? Why is Nostra important? Why is it nice if you can, you know, mitigate some risk by buying the ETF? Like it's all again, I think this personal choice. But with Bitcoin, I find it interesting that probably over time, you know, if you buy two percent in the ETF or a micro strategy, and you know that portion of your portfolio goes up, you're going to pay more attention to it. You know, there are going to be these, mm -hmm. these, these touch points, um, around Bitcoin, you know, whatever they are, whether they are like computer science or the, you know, the math stuff or the money stuff or whatever that will draw you into this, yeah, to this bigger rabbit hole on, yeah, what is money? I think that is the core of that, of that, that rabbit hole in that sense. I, I think, I think that that will happen. Um, Yesterday I saw a tweet of someone who says like, isn't isn't the entire value of Bitcoin derived from the fact that you can hold it in self custody, right? That that is the the achievement of the true sovereignty, true um, you know a neutral, trustless, global, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, money. Mm -hmm. 
And I really agree with that. But if you have to get there by getting into MicroStrategy first or an ETF, and then, you know, eventually you diversify and diversify a bit more and um, you maybe get, you know, the biggest portion in self-custody, you know, I think for some people that will happen, for some people it won't, but yeah, eventually I think it's fine. I, I, yeah, I think it's fine. That's so interesting. I've, I've had a few conversations and heard some comments about people saying, well, you have to study and understand Bitcoin first, and then you can maybe understand <coughs> what MicroStrategy is trying to do. And and you're and there's just different doors that people could walk through. Maybe someone told them about this equity and that with their background, they're more comfortable with yeah. NVIDIA or the Magnificent Seven. And they're like, oh, there's this other equity that's doing really well. And they're like, oh, great. And it's like, you're not talking about Bitcoin at all. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's so interesting how people could walk through different doors. I think that's the level of understanding, but also interest. Like, do I want to figure this out? Uh, what you just said, um, you know, you need to understand Bitcoin before you get into it. Like, I, I think a few years ago, I would have definitely said 100% yes. Now, you know, I think the general advice of get some Bitcoin, like $100 or 50 or whatever you can, you know, um, miss. And then just watch it, see what happens, you know, it goes up, down, up, down. Over time, it goes up. Yeah. If you're curious enough, it will draw you in. And then you will see these different dimensions. Oh, what does it mean when it's in an ETF? What does it mean that there's this company that has a treasury? What's a company treasury actually? You know, what is the problem that he's solving? What's the arc that Michael Saylor went through? You know, he has the famous tweet of, uh, you know, Bitcoin's uh, days are numbered, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a good talk about how he went from like skeptic to critic and et cetera, to like total, uh, totally orange built advocate, you know? Um, I think it'll eventually work like that. And that's also why I see Bitcoin is just like this individual mind virus. It's like, you cannot pitch Bitcoin in one way to a thousand people. You have to pitch it in a thousand ways, probably just trying to find that angle that works for that person. And, and you cannot orange pill another person. I think it's more about what, what is your touch point or what's the angle that you look at your life or money or business or what, what, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I see it. That's also why I, th I think it's great that you started this. Like we need more podcasts, like your angle of how you talk about it resonates with other people than how I talk about it, for example. Sure. But it's equally important, yeah. I guess, you know, right now we're sitting in the middle of Manhattan mm. and everybody that we're walking by on the street, either is already independently wealthy, they're in college, yeah. or they really are out there trying to make money. <clears throat> or they don't care about money, but you know, very corporate, very profit driven. How is it even possible that Bitcoin is 15 years old, 16 years old, and it's the best performing asset of all time. Yeah. Um, and the adoption rate's still like 1%. Like, is it the volatility of it? Is it, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think this is the question. Um, <laughs> I think it's, yeah, if we would go outside now and we ask 50 people, they will probably have heard about Bitcoin. None of them would probably be into it. Maybe one one person, they wouldn't know the price. And yeah, I find it fascinating. Like I, I don't have a finance background. I don't have an economics background. I worked in TradFi, but but like I don't, I don't, I don't have an education in that. And I cannot believe that I figured this out <laughs> basically. Like how, how can I, have a thought that's like, you know, uh, or agree with, for example, what Saylor says about, you know, the first con country to print its own currency will be the richest and buy Bitcoin and will be the richest country in the world. It's so logical. It's uh, It just makes sense. It's, it's it, Yeah, <laughs> but so I like to believe that if I figure that out too and agree with that, that I cannot imagine that there are no rulers in certain countries that have come to the same conclusion that would really lower my trust in other people more or something i don't know like i think it's just I, it's very fascinating very very fascinating i do think that you know in a western world as we talked about yeah if your money just works then you don't really have a problem i think people do have a problem they, they they see that the prices are going up but they are blaming the wrong problems you know i mean you have elizabeth warren talking about uh, you know the greedy capital uh, capitalist uh, companies etc 
Um, I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't think enough people are curious enough to be like, hmm, why, why are so many smart people focusing on Bitcoin? Why is this Pompliano guy or Natalie Brunel woman? Why do they speak so eloquently on, on, uh, on the TV <laughs> about this thing? Why are they so enthusiastic? You know, um, I think you have to be curious to eventually get into Bitcoin, but I, I think, and uh, the thing that anyone needs to realize is that everyone in, 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 in countries that use a fiat money system, we all have the same, the same problem basically. Mm -hmm. So I think a good eye opener for me is that I talked to uh, Tony Yasbeck. He's from, uh, I think, I believe Lebanon, if I'm uh, not mistaken. And he told me that he had a hundred percent inflation one day to the other. So everything that he owned was gone. And there are people in Lebanon that rob banks to get their own money, not other people's money, to just to get their own money out. And when I realized that they use the same fiat money system as we use, but they just have a different currency, I realized, oh, well, that can happen in my country, probably as one of the last, maybe before <laughs> before it happens here, right? Because it's 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 a strong block. But there's no difference in in the system, debt-based fiat money system. It's 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 the same thing. And so how I kind of explain it to people now is okay what's the most finite thing you have? It's your time in your life, right? We don't know how much time we have, okay? And so the energy that you expend in your time, that's your productivity. And once you give it away, it's gone. And how you are rewarded for expending that finite energy in time is with a reward that can be infinitely created. So that's a very stupid trade to make. And that's okay because you never thought about it. But once you realize that that is like the dumbest thing that you can do, because the, you know if the reward can be created infinitely, it it will lower in value over time, right? That's a debasement that we talk about. Mm -hmm. So everyone has that problem because we are all spending our energy in time in in some degree, right, with a job or a venture or whatever. And so once you realize that the reward that you're getting is a flawed reward, that it basically steals your energy in time then I think we can get to like the point of why is Bitcoin then the solution of that? But I think just that concept is something that no one, no one is thinking about. They still think they can save, they can get more units of, of a currency and save that in their bank account. But what you can buy with it obviously becomes less. And I think it's just, I don't know if it's ignorance or something. I don't know. It's just, I, I think this is the core thing of what people need to realize. But as long as the problem is not big enough in your, you know, individual physical life, then uh, yeah, and people are not going to pay attention. So I think we are very privileged and lucky that that we have time and space to think about this and discuss this and 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 figure it out over time. Um, so yeah, it's 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 that for me. That's the core of what I think people should understand. But it, it's still baffling to me. <laughs> yeah, I think we could sit here for you know, I don't know three, four, five hours and mm. just keep going. Yeah. Um, I super appreciate your time. Where can people find you online and um, any other resources or closing thoughts? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate that too. I think uh, really great, great to squeeze it in this in. Um, people can find me on Twitter. I think it's uh, most easy. Uh, I'm Bramke, B-R-A-M-K on Twitter. And my podcast is called Bitcoin for Millennials. And you can find that on uh, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, everywhere. And uh, I think if there's one video that people should watch, uh, it's not one of one of mine, but uh, that's uh, Lynn Alden, Broken Money. That's 32 minutes. And I think that really uh, shows you the problem that you don't know you have. So I would uh, recommend that. Yeah. And that's the animated video that she did. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. It, that is excellent. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Lynn a few times, including when she did her talk at Princeton University. Mm, and cool. just yeah. yeah, really, really great. So. Well, thanks so much. And I hope we can do this again. Maybe next time I'll come to, come to you. Yeah, we'll do that. Cool, man. Thank thanks. you.